Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're going to talk about Tilikum Lelum Aboriginal Friendship Centre. Most people in Nanaimo know that it exists, but how many of us know why it exists? Tonight, we're going to find out. So I have with me tonight, I have Tammy Miles and Courtney DeFriend, administrators with Tilikum Lelum Friendship Centre. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thanks to the for having th us. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah. So uh, why don't we start with finding out the mandate of uh, Tilikum Lelum Aboriginal Friendship Centre. Why does it exist? What, what's its mandate? Sure. Time? Well, Tilikum Lelum has been in existence in Nanaimo since 1965. It was incorporated as a non-profit organization in 1968. And the purpose was that there were so many people, Indigenous people coming in from outer lying areas into the urban centre and there was no place for them to gather. So originally it was a coffee drop-in centre because at that time uh, it was seen that Indigenous people were not able to provide service. Um, however, we could refer to other organisations. So since then, um, there's a mission statement that says that we promote fairness and equality for all people who request our service and help. And uh, so within our mission statement, we're open to all people. So it's kind of a myth that's around that we're only an Aboriginal organization. Yes, we operate on Indigenous ways of knowing and being in the world. However, we're open to anybody who is requiring service. I understand that Tilikum Lelum Friendship Centre has like, like 60 programs nowadays. Correct. Could we talk about some, Courtney, I think you're up on that uh, matter. Sure. Could you tell me a little bit of some of the programs that uh, Tilikum Lelum offers? Yeah, so we, um, we've we been working all kind of all over the community now and um, have a couple of different sites that we work out of. And so we have a health centre, an education centre. Um, we have kind of satellite offices in the hospital and in the prison. Um, we operate out of the Franklin Street Gym downtown. Uh, and then we also have our, our 10th Street property, property, which is the Tilikum Village. And so I think that's what started to gain a lot of the attention of the folks in the community is um, the Tilikum Village. So that program or that uh, property has a couple of different programs and, um, you know, primarily housing. And so when we look at how important the social determinants of health are and how, you know, the foundational piece of wellness is um, food and shelter, that that's something that we've aligned our values with. And so we, we put a lot of um, uh, attention into making sure that the basic needs of our people are, are met. And so we have a, a youth safe house. And um, that was actually established in a little farmhouse. The entire property that we were on, or the 10th Street property that we're currently on is, uh, was a, a farmhouse. And uh, so we started out of a tiny little house and it was lots of volunteer work that went into developing that program. And we, I remember when that program started and just the rejoice that was happening throughout the organization because um, we were so blessed to have a, a program that was to meet the needs of, of youth that were homeless. And so, um, you know, that's funded by Island Health Authority and MCFD, Ministry of Children and Family Development. And um, you know that basically providing some some housing support for youth that aren't quite fitting into the mainstream programs or mainstream housing, and if there you know there's issues at home or anything like that, um, then that program's there for them, and it's very low barrier, and we've had really good support in the community around that program. I understand it's not just the native and non-native kids get uh, helped at that place. That's right. So uh, fr the friendship centers are, are actually, there's 118 in the entire country. So we're kind of uh, like a chain or what we call is a movement. And so one of our mandates or missions is that we are open to the entire community. And although we work from an Indigenous perspective, um, it's important that we're inclusive. And there's lots of folks that come from mixed backgrounds and um, different walks of life or are attracted to different cultures or um, um, you know, and so we're open and, and receptive to providing service for everybody in that context. And yeah, so there's also your, uh, your youth and elders complex, and that's a new concept where the youth and elders live together, and there's a consciously made that way for the one to sort of help the other. You know complement the other. That's right. So um, we have the youth and elders housing is a really kind of innovative model that, that is through it's funded through um, BC Housing and um, AMA and uh, basically it's looking at making sure that you know we're honoring the traditional community model around elders raising healthy adults and children or children into adults and so uh, traditionally elders would often be the ones who are raising the young people in the community and and what we 
know about youth and resiliency is that that belonging piece is so important for them to be able to be connected and understand who they are and where they come from. So if you look at the circle, uh, that's, that's something that we use in, in our models of community um, development, support, the life cycle, programming, and it, it represents so many different things. And what our value in the circle is, is that there's no beginning and there's no end, and that every p component of it is equal. And so when we look at the life cycle being cyclical and or cir circular, um, you know, that relates to uh, looking at how important all of the different life stages are. And one of them is youth and another one is elders. So bringing those two together creates fluidity in that circle. Makes a great deal of sense. Yeah, and yeah. A, the circle is an important part of the, the native sort of culture and perspective on the world. And now something that you, Tammy, have talked about is the medicine wheel. Could you just touch a little bit on that? Because I know that it has a great deal to do with the programs that Telecom Wheelam uh, puts out there. Could yeah, sure. So if you looked at a circle and you cut it into four equal parts, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, if we live our life in balance as an individual, as a human being, we can live up to our fullest potential. But if one of those quadrants is out of balance, then um, we can't live up to our fullest potential. We're not solid. So here in this territory on the West Coast, we're all longhouse people. So we have the same values or the same understanding where each of the posts of the longhouse are mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. And if one of those house posts is off balance, then our life is out of balance as well. So the other um, teaching around that uh, concept is that anything we say, anything we do, any way we behave impacts the next seven generations. So anything that we're involved in or any of the programs that we design, we know that there will be a positive impact for the next seven generations. So anything that Tilikum offers in a positive way for healing, connection, belonging, um, will impact our families in a more positive way. And going back to the elders and youth um, housing, there was a huge gap, or there is a huge gap in our families and in our communities between elders and youth because we have so many kids in care of the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is when you live in an urban setting, you don't always have access to your elders or your grandparents or your aunts and uncles. So we create surrogate families within the community where people can connect and belong and learn. And there's lots of things that go on in that youth and elders building where there's this reciprocal teaching happening. So the elders are teaching things like knitting, canning, carving, um, teachings or understandings, values, and the, the youth are helping elders with computers and <laughs> navigating bus routes. And um, so there's a lot of things that are going on where there's reciprocity happening, which is part of the culture as well. So we reciprocity, when we look at the four posts again, reciprocity, um, resiliency, relationships, and responsibility. And these are all things that have been impacted by colonization and residential school that we need to reignite these values and make them available for our communities. Another thing too is that the youth, uh, they bring their enthusiasm, you know, their energy, and uh, that's very stimulating for elders. And of course the elders, they have their wisdom, you know, their experience, and yes. it makes all the sense in the world if they can bring that together you know, that energy and enthusiasm coupled with the wisdom of the elders, you've got a real power for some good happening, mm -hmm. wouldn't you yeah, say? Yeah, for sure. Now, your newly constructed child care centre yes. is just ready for opening. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So Tammy is the, pro is the project manager of that particular program. Um, but coming back to the, the different life stages within the circle is that our children or our infants and children is one other component of that. And so um, something that's really starting to become, uh, that's starting to manifest in community services across the mainstream and within all societies is um, continuum of care and how important it is to be looking at the fluidity of service. When somebody's accessing programs, there needs to be accessibility there. 
and um, you know so and and making sure that we're uh, creating opportunity to be moving from one stage to another and still be supported and so when we look at fragmentation of programs within the community oftentimes you know there's only programs for up to six years old in one building or there's only programs that are meeting one particular need in one in another setting and so it becomes very fragmented and and traditionally if you look at the circle everything is is important to be connected and accessible so when we look at the child care center that was a huge part of our vision and and something that we've been working towards within the Tillicum village for a long time because what we know is that um, we start to develop human beings right from conception and so in order to make sure that we have healthy human beings and healthy community members we need to start with the babies and so um, our baby in in the local language the Halkumitnam language Kek means baby and so we've we've introduced a program called Kek College as well and so it's baby college so looking at you know in partnerships beautiful partnerships with the with the school district and with the Ministry of Children and Family Development looking at how can we start looking at preventative um, measures to to um, some of these social issues that we're so overrepresented in and how do we look at promoting um, a healthy lifestyle when it's really impactful and effective so um, the child care center is is represent is a representative of more than just um, you know a social enterprise or an opportunity to have daycare in community or, or infant programs in community. It's about changing community and, and looking at systemic and social issues that we've struggled with intergenerationally and really having a, a you know, um, kind of be, taking initiative and, and looking at how are we, are we changing the community and how can we tackle these social issues. So, um, you know, looking at some of these services, uh, children are the foundational piece of, of what we're looking at for, you know, the future. And so by uh, receiving capital funds from the Ministry of Children and Family and many uh, very generous donations in the community, we've been able to finance a building in order to create healthy lifestyles and legacy um, and hopefully promote change within First Nations communities and the greater community as well. It's a magnificent uh, structure and we've Shown a little couple of photos from the outside. Now we actually have a, a little video clip of the uh, of the interior of the uh, of the center. We actually have two. We'll uh, we'll run the first one right now, and we can uh, we can talk while uh, the viewer is uh, watching as we go through it. So, uh, so <clears throat> one of the things that's happening with the child care center right now is we're just in the process of getting an occupancy permit so that we can open up. And Courtney was uh, talking about it as a social enterprise. Tillicum doesn't charge for any of its programs, although a lot of uh, programs are run by donation and lots of government funds. It is completely proposal driven. The child care center and the daycare center that we just took over on Bruce Avenue or 7th Street on the Barsby, John Barsby School property there are the only programs that Tillicum charges for. And it is still a nonprofit, and any profit that will be made will go back into the programs. However, um, currently we are not making anything. And uh, in fact, I think we're going backwards a little bit at the moment, but that's okay, because um, we're determined that it's gonna all come together and balance out. Um, currently, the Child Care Center has a $1.7 million mortgage. There is a myth in the community, I believe, by mainstream people is that <clears throat> because we're an Aboriginal organization that we have access to all kinds of funding, which is completely untrue. So as an urban Aboriginal organization, we are not privy to the same funding that First Nations are uh, are able to access. And oftentimes I run into people all the time, people that I've known for most of my life that ask me if I still work for the band. And I've never worked for the band, and um, I've worked for most of my career on and off uh, for friendship centers, and um, they're completely different entities. And uh, it's kind of like I've said in a few talks, you know, it's like saying to a Scottish person, you should go down to the Sons of Norway because I'm sure they'd help you out because we're all completely different. Um, our tribes are completely different, but one of the things about the Friendship Centers is we're open to all nations. And uh, being open to all nations, we have foundational values as Indigenous people that are worldwide. And although our ceremonies may be different, our rituals may be different, we all have the same fundamental uh, understanding around living life in balance. 
so the mental, physical, spiritually, and emotional, but we also have values around respect and love and truth and faith and honesty and being humble. And those are all embedded into all the programs. And Courtney was talking about we need to start out with the babies. And uh, if we can instill those teachings right from a very young age, they're going to have way better outcomes as adults and be way more connected, um, more solid in the community and in their families if they've been supported from the beginning. The challenge that we deal with right now is with over 60% of the kids in care being Aboriginal, we don't even have the ability to to start on a solid foundation with those little people. So the vision of the child care center is to have those babies in the community supported with wraparound services and have those families supported with wraparound services. Wasn't there a saying that you shared it's easier to start with the baby and how does that go? Yeah, yeah, it's easier to raise a healthy child than to repair a broken man. Yeah, that's, that, that rings true. Yeah. It really yeah, does. Yeah. That really does. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, why don't we have another little tour through the, uh, the center? We've got one more clip through the uh, Child Care Center. Yes, for sure. And uh, we'll let that and we can, um, let's see, we can perhaps, um, there's some of the other, how, how is, of course, you're opening soon. Yes, and so um, the plan from the very beginning was to have three to five year old care on the main floor and uh, after school care for five to 12 year olds upstairs in the building. And we've already been asked and already been talking about how do we expand. So we're looking at possibly getting um, 12 infant toddler spaces available within that building as well. We just have to rework the space a little bit and just to meet licensing. And um, <clears throat> so that'll be exciting to have uh, more small people on on site and to be able to support them in their journey. The other opportunity that's kind of in the works at the moment is um, we didn't quite get this community support that we had hoped for and that so we are also applying for Aboriginal Head Start funding which would open those three to five year old spaces up for urban Aboriginal children. They, um, there's not very many urban Aboriginal Head Start programs in the province and the province has just announced that they're going to release um, funds for 12 spaces or 12 urban child Aboriginal Head Start spaces. So uh, we're hoping to apply for that as well. Like you're breaking some new ground here. Then yeah. Like yeah, well, I think it's important to look at to um, just the change in legislation that's happening and that there's really kind of some rumbling that's happening at a provincial level. And that's really exciting to us. But, you know, a lot of folks are asking us about how is our services different in the community than mainstream uh, services. And, and, you know, <clears throat> it's really interesting in a conversation that I'm constantly coming up um, against or with, I, I, alongside um, in our communities is that a lot of the models and a lot of the ideas that we have um, within our programming um, at, a, at a provincial level that's new or innovative right now is actually very traditional. And it's, and it's been around for a really long time. So I'll give you a couple of examples about you know, we're looking at collaboration um, and, you know, interministerial kind of collaboration now. And that's been very exciting around how can we start looking at community approaches to uh, fluidity in, in care with, with children and families. And so um, there's lots of motivation around how can we start doing this. And, you know, what, what, I, what I'm hearing is, is and what I, what I believe is that that's not only something that friendship centers and Indigenous populations has always been promoting for my entire life and I would argue much longer than my entire life um, you know that that's something that's a traditional teaching of ours as well and and uh, you know so traditionally it w around looking at that community model it's about that collaboration and about the systemic um, perspective so you know, there's lots of theories and things that are being endorsed by mainstream society saying this is a good idea. And, and you know, uh, for example, with Tilikum Lalem being in the community for 53 years, it's like, yeah, and we've been actually doing that the whole time is integrating services. So, you know, asking about some of our programs, those housing programs are just at the very, at the very uh, foundational component of our, of our service model. And so we also do lots of services with addiction and family support and hospital liaison 
on and youth programs. We've been very um, wealthy in, in youth programs, not financially, but in the way that we are able to operate our youth programs and be creative with our youth programs. And, and that's something that the Friendship Center movement has always held very strong is the, is the importance of the youth and that, you know, the youth can basically be the movers of the world. And so um, when we look at a lot of our traditional foundational teachings that are ancient sacred laws to us, that's now coming out in legislation. And so we're really excited about that, that it's like people are catching up and, and the communities are catching up. And now, now we're looking at how that is going to ripple effect in or out of that collective model. So, you know, it's really important to look at indigenous um, programming as a collective perspective and Western approaches are, are very individualistic and so um, traditionally my understanding of a lot of the Western approach is very client-centered in that it's individualized so for example you know if there's an issue um, with an with a, an, an individual uh, we're we're treating the symptom of the individual uh, whereas now we're starting to look at you know this innovative research around wait a minute this person is part of a system just like an ecosystem or any type of system a respiratory system there's so many different complexities and parts that create the operation of that that component and so if we look at the individual as living in a system that's the collective perspective of this person is connected to family they have intergenerational um, beliefs or traumas or uh, contributors their ecosystem is a part of who they are and their environment is a part of who they are um, so collectively we're looking at a bigger system and stepping back and and so you're seeing that starting where I'm seeing it manifesting in the community services mainstream um, but you know it, it's it's labeled as, as innovative and new and, and I would argue that it's one of the most ancient things that we that we've done in community is is that collective model. Another so. example of that is mindfulness. Mindfulness is the big buzz right now. We're taught in our indigenous culture that you need to be quiet. You need to be uh, step back and calm yourself and um, listen to the words and the wisdom and the messages that may come to you in your mindful state. So until an academic says it's so, it's not so <laughs> in our world. It sounds like there's some real cross-pollinization happening here. There's some uh, learning that's happening. And I think that's uh, implications on a global level because what, what's happening, we say in the native and non-native worlds here in our corner of the world could, and not to my mind, should happen globally. Why can't that happen globally, you know? And I think somehow it will, and, and this is, to my mind, is part of the, part of the process, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's other programs, I know, and uh, we've only got a few minutes here, mm -hmm. but uh, there was uh, there's a couple of success stories you, sh you shared with me, and perhaps you'd like to share one sure. before we wind up here. Yeah, I, uh, I wish I could share more. I, there's, there's lots, and that's the rewarding part of, of the work. And, you know, we look at nonprofits and, and that they're, you know, the wealth comes from a different area, and it's about that kind of hu humanity wealth and, and not so much about physical or, you know, um, uh, cash wealth. And so th that is really what I think drives the bus is our success stories. And so, you know, there's folks that have, that myself included, that have been raised at the Friendship Center and now work at the Friendship Center. And so Tammy was talking about reciprocity and how important it is to receive and then give back. And that's such a, that's such a sacred teaching of ours to create that fluidity energetically and, you know, have that kind of abundance be carried forward. And so one of the success stories that I love and, and somebody that I cherish very dearly, just based on her success, I'm so proud of her as, you know, somebody that, that was introduced to us based on our, our um, appearance in the hospital. And so that was the first time that we had contact was right within that kind of acute setting. And, um, you know, saying that this person is homeless and this person has nowhere to go and brand new baby. And what, you know, what do we do? And so, you know, very often it's so common for our, our prenatal programs or our family support programs to go into the hospital and meet a client right in, in the hospital. And so, you know, uh, it was myself, I went in and I, I, I got to meet this individual and kind of said, this is the opportunity that we have around housing. Um, and these are the wraparound supports. And so, you know, that this individual embraced every opportunity that she could around support services for her child, for herself, for her family. 
um, within housing, accessing different supplemental programs um, like Creating Healthy Families or the prenatal programs, um, and then has accessed employment programs. So when we look at measurables of success from a Western um, perspective or a government perspective, a lot of the time it's quantitative and it's like how many folks have been employed. But when we look at the journey of some of these people, it's like we're starting at a very foundational level around housing or around basic needs. And so this success story particularly, you know, she, she really um, took advantage of every single one. And over, you know, four years and usually, you know, our contractors will say you have six weeks or you have six months and then that's it. And you don't want to gain too much of a relationship with your participant. Um, so this, this person, you know, over the last four years that I've been in contact with them, um, has engaged in so many dis different services and is now, um, you know, her child is one of the most brilliant children I've ever met and has just a beautiful soul and she's employed and she has her driver's license and she's going to work every day and she's, you know, she's contributing back to the Friendship Centre and, and, you know, I've had the opportunity to bring her to different conferences to speak about issues around young parents and, and mental health and wellness and all of these different areas. So when we're lifting people up and giving them an opportunity, they really thrive. But if they aren't starting at that foundational level of, you know, that intervention stage where people are really needing the support, it's really difficult to thrive in different areas. So well, it sounds like there's got some important stuff afoot here. And I really wish you had more time to get mm -hmm. into it. I think we're out of time here. So I'm going to have to wrap up with thanks to you both Thank for you coming. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. We'll talk again. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to say uh, good night, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Lewis Beck, and this has been Coast Connections. We'll see you next week.